Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Ken Irish Bramble, and I want to welcome all of you uh, to this evening's programming in honor of Black Solidarity Day. Uh, the Black Solidarity Day programming here at Medgar Evers College is being brought to you um, as a collaborative effort between the Caribbean Research Center um, and the Department for Social and Behavioral uh, Sciences. Uh, in order to get us started, I just wanted to put in context um, the, the whole history of Black Solidarity Day and the significance of it. And to help do that, I'm going to start us off with a short video uh, clip, which I've borrowed from <laughs> Mr. Charles Blow. Um, so let's, uh, let's start off with that. For hundreds of years, Black America's relationship with this moment was fraught with mixed emotions and at times even paralyzing fear. For example, 101 years ago, a mob of white vigilantes were responsible for what some say is the single bloodiest day in political history. On this day in 2000 and, uh, 1920, I'm sorry, not 2020, when Black residents of o, uh, o Ka o Oxia, Ka uh, Florida, attempted to cast their ballots. Dozens were killed with fire was set to their homes. Now, fast forward to last night, New York voters overwhelmingly chose Democratic candidate Eric Adams, a black man, to lead the nation's largest city. In his victory, Adams overwhelmingly captured black vote. From then to now, a portrait of black voting power. To highlight the power of the black vote on this day in 1969, a committee of leaders designated November 3rd Black Solidarity Day, a national day of unity and awareness among all people of the di diaspora in America with a pur purpose both symbolic and very tangible. It called for African Americans to abstain from social, political, and economic affairs of the nation and wear all black in a collective show of unity. Black Solidarity Day was spearheaded by activist Carlos E. Russell and is annually observed as a day before Election Day in November. Part of its purpose was to show the spending power communities of color have and their impact on the overall economy. Participation was meant to draw attention to racial inequality and economic disparities among urban minorities. Even today, Black Solidarity Day is a reminder of the collective strength and political power of the nation's black citizens. At one time, the day was observed in 21 cities and at, at many historically black colleges and universities around the country. Black Solidarity Day is still celebrated in pockets of New York City's neighborhoods. So today, we remember Black Solidarity Day and reflect on the power of the black vote. And that is for the culture. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, I was hoping that that video would help put into context um, one of the, the significance of Black Solidarity Day. Um, I do want to take a moment to recognize uh, Dr. Carlos Russell, um, who is the founder, recognizes the founder of Black Solidarity Day. Um, and just a brief background on Dr. Russell. So Dr. Russell, I think I wanted to do that. Uh, Dr. Russell was uh, born in Panama, um, served as an ambassador both to the Organization of American States, um, African States, excuse me, um, and to the United Nations. Uh, he was professor and chair of field studies at SUNY Old Westbury. Um, he was the dean of contemporary studies at Brooklyn College. Um, he was the acting director of international and urban affairs at Medgar Evers College here at CUNY, a member of the Research Center Advisory Board, um, and into his work as an artist and, and activist. Uh, one of his accomplishments was that he published Miss Anna's Son Remembers, which is uh, known to be the first book of Panamanian West Indian poems uh, published outside of Panama. Um, Dr. Russell uh, and his, uh, his colleagues founded uh, the Black Solidarity Day um, as the first Monday uh, of each November. Um, so therefore, the Monday before Election Day 
um, each year, uh, and it is celebrated here throughout New York City um, and across the country. Um, the concept of, uh, of this day was actually based on a play that, um, that he had encountered um, called A Day of Absence. And in this particular um, play, it, it really centered on the idea of Blacks within a rural uh, southern town deciding that they would boycott all activity within um, that territory in order to demonstrate their economic power and fight for change. And so he took this concept um, or borrowed this concept um, and put it into action uh, back in 1969. Um, and the idea was to demonstrate the power of Black economics and to use Black economic power as a means of activism to promote positive change in the United States um, and beyond. Black Solidarity Day continues to be observed in many Black communities and here at Medgar Evers College, um, CRC and SBS are proud of our record of annually bringing the think is quality programming um, to the community in order to recognize and honor um, this day. Uh, Dr. Carlos Russell passed um, in 2018. And so we also think it's fitting to take this time to recognize his contribution um, as a activist and a leader in the black community. Point in time, I also want to share one last video clip before I pass the microphone, so to speak, um, over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Delangoria. Forgive me, I do have, there we go. You're not. All right, so forgive me for the technical difficulty there. I am uh, doing this <laughs> uh, solo on this end. Uh, let's see if we can get it right this time. Oh, maybe not. All right, here we go, got it. All right, so I'm gonna share a short clip just talking about uh, Dr. Russell um, in recognition of his contribution uh, to the Black Liberation. Verity Day. Black Panamanian poet, writer, activist, organizer, and educator, Carlos Russell was born on August 6, 1934, in the then US-controlled Panama Canal Zone, in the predominantly Black town of La Boca. His parents were Anna L. Cordington Russell and Alberto H. Russell. They had lineages from Barbados and Jamaica. His familial histories are tied to the quarter of a million Afro-Caribbean people that built key infrastructure in Panama, including the famed canal and the cultural capital that forever changed the isthmus. Russell graduated from the National Institute in Panama and left the country in 1955 on a student visa to DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. He lived and worked on the south side of Chicago. He was in Chicago following the aftermath of the lynching of Emmett Till. Russell was among those who could point to Emmett Till's murder and his funeral as an ultimate moment of consciousness raising. Russell moved to Brooklyn, New York in 1961, where he continued to work as an organizer and educator in various capacities. During the 1960s and 1970s, Dr. Russell was a primary organizer for the first National Conference of Panamanians. He was also one of the creators of Bayanu, which is the first black newspaper and Panamanian newspaper in the US written in both English and Spanish. Other co-founders noted are George Priestley, Walter Livingston, Aguilla Jimenez, and others. Carlos Russell was ambassador to the Organization of American States, 
And while serving as the Panamanian ambassador for the United Nations, Dr. Russell, inspired by Douglas Turner Ward's fictional play, Day of Absence, in which a small town in the South is suddenly devoid of its black population and is crippled by their absence, he established Black Solidarity Day in 1969. Black Solidarity Day is held annually on the Monday before election day in November. Black people are encouraged not to attend school or work and to abstain from shopping in white establishments. Dr. Russell was professor and chair of field studies at SUNY Old Westbury and professor emeritus at Brooklyn College CUNY before becoming Dean of Contemporary Studies. Carlos Russell passed at the age of 84 in 2018, but his legacy lives on. It was part of the insidious systemic racism in the country that forced, forced people to deny who they were. And uh, it is something that, that I don't think that we have given enough attention to recognizing how, what effect, what Joy Leary calls uh, post-enslavement uh, traumatic syndrome is all about. All right. Um, having... And my apologies for the technical issues over here. Uh, I'm trying to manage them all on my own. All right. Um, having said all of that, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Maria Delongoria, who is the chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and which is, of course, co-hosting this evening's event. Um, Dr. Delongoria, please, if you will. Hi, good evening, everyone. I want to start by thanking you all for, for coming and uh, participating. Um, we're really excited. We This is, our, I think, our fourth or fifth year that um, the Department of Social Behavioral Sciences and the Caribbean Research Center have partnered on the Black Solidarity Day programming. And it's something that's that's really important for us and to us. I think sometimes people overlook the significance of it and what the impact really could have been and what the impact is. Um, and Dr. Irish Bramble showed you uh, a clip about um, Carlos Russell and where he got his inspiration for Black Solidarity Day. So there is something else. Other people have also gotten inspiration from um, that play, but also from the concept of Black Solidarity Day. There is something a little bit more recent. Now, by recent, I'm not talking about like the 2000s, but 1994, there was a um, show called Cosmic Slop. And it was the name was taken from um, George Clinton and Funkadelic. But Cosmic Slop was done by the Hudlin brothers. And it is, there's a section of it called Space Traders, which builds on this idea of a day of absence and this idea of Black Solidarity Day. And in that, in that, that segment, it's left, is a referendum that's put on the ballot and it's left up to the United States to vote whether it's going to give away all its Black people. And how this unfolds, you, you see what the discussions are and what Black folks mean or don't mean to the United States. And they, it, it kind of unfolds, so it kind of elaborates. And it, although it's it's definitely fictional, right? Because there's not that we know of any space traders that are trying to take black people from the United States, but it puts a different perspective on on um, another perspective on this whole idea of of black wealth and black worth and the contributions of black folks to the United States in particular. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And um, I want to then introduce. I'm going to segue into. Um, the program itself, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Akimba Ajure, who most of you know. Uh, he is going to be your moderator for the evening. He is also a um, faculty member in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. What a lot of you may not know is that he is also a graduate of Mega Rivers College. And so we are really proud that you know he has graduated from Mega and has gone on to do some amazing things, but still is connected enough to his people and his roots that he wants to be back here. And so Dr. Uh, Akimbe. Hey, greetings everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Della Gloria, uh, who was also a, a professor of mine as a mentor when I was a student here. So, um, you know, and I appreciate all the support uh, on my, along my journey. Um, and yes, I was gonna talk about me graduating from Mega kind of stole my thunder. <laughs> but yes, I am a graduate of Mega Evans and um, 
you know, I'm real proud to uh, to have graduated and also uh, in, instruct or teach at an institution that bears the name of uh, Mega Evers College, one of our great uh, Black heroes and leaders uh, who fought for a lot of the rights that we have uh, today. Um, so, you know, with Black Solidarity Day, I'm really looking forward to having this discussion around uh, Black Solidarity Day. We sort of just look at some of the history, a brief history of Black Solidarity Day. Um, and one thing about uh, this day is is it's not a a day of uh, celebration. It's it's a day of uh, commemoration and remembrance, um, but it's a day that was born out of resistance in 1969 um, during the Black Power Movement, and, um, and it was actually birthed during a time where uh, we began to identify ourselves as Black and no longer Negro. Um, and so we would see Negro History Week go uh, Black History. Black History Month be born out of Negro History Week. And, um, and a lot of the Black, uh, a lot of people from the African-American community began to identify themselves as Black. Um, but Black Solidarity Day, like many of our uh, days of commemoration and remembrance, such as Juneteenth, uh, these days were born out of resistance, out of struggle. Um, and just like with Juneteenth, when, our, uh, when Black people came together, not just they didn't come together just to celebrate the ending of chattel slavery, um, which they should have, right? Uh, but when they came together and they also discussed politics and what needed to be done to advance the um, to advance Black people uh, in this country and the society. And Black Solidarity Day is a, is a day that we do. It's it's a day before the election for a reason. So um, today's theme is education. This is what we want to discuss. What is the agenda? or what should the agenda be for Black people uh, moving forward in two, 2023 and beyond as it pertains to education. Uh, so with that being said, we have a dynamic panel. Um, I have a lot to say, but I'm falling back and letting the panel uh, uh, discuss this and what the future uh, should be for Black people as it revolves around uh, education. So I'm gonna briefly uh, introduce our panelists and we have some, some great you know, educators, community organizers. We have Brother Nemo, who's a Pan-Africanist educator and community organizer, who's going to be uh, a part of this panel. We have um, Brother Tommy, Brother Tommy Joshua, founder and executive director of Philly Peace Park in, um, in North Philadelphia and West Philadelphia in particular. And uh, I know Brother Tommy and, and those who are part of the Peace Park are actually developing a school to address uh, the educational needs of, of uh, Black people. Uh, we have uh, Natasha Robert, who is a community organizer and doctoral student at Columbia. So, and Dr. Michelle Luart, principal and uh, principal uh, in the New York City Department of Education, as well as Dr. Tabor Johnson, associate professor at Mega Evers College, representing MEC. Um, so this is our panel for tonight, and I want to thank everybody for joining us and being a part of this discussion. And we're going to uh, jump right into it with, uh, with some questions for the panel. So uh, the first question that I, I wanted to ask, uh, we saw a history, brief history of Black Solidarity Day and what it is, but I uh, wanted to hear from you guys what Black Solidarity Day means to you, or Black Solidarity what does even the, the phrase Black Solidarity, what does that mean or, or what does that look like uh, to you? And we can start with, with brother, but oh, let me start with this, Natasha. Uh, Natasha, you wanna start off the panel discussion? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, Again, thank you everyone for um, having me here today. I'm glad to be part of this gathering and um, sharing space with everyone and community to, to talk about, you know, us as a people. And for me, Black Solidarity Day means, um, the phrase is no work, no school, no shopping, as um, we commonly know. But also to put it simply, Black Solidarity Day means to me, you know, African Black people uniting and standing together um, and working toward liberation in a way that um, is critical in a way that allows us to really sit down and think and also discuss with each other um, what are the best ways forward. So that's what like Black Solidarity slash Black Solidarity, Solidarity Day uh, means to me. 
and we could do this free flowing. If, if you wanted to answer questions, jump in and go right ahead. Um, um, okay, sorry, go ahead. No, you can go ahead, sister. Um, I think for me, the notion of black solidarity means first defining our agenda, being really clear about what that is, that we're unified black agenda that goes beyond conversation um, and taking action on it. Um, the, I, the concept united we stand, divided we fall comes to mind when I think of black solidarity in that it's really important that even if we have differences and different ideologies that we're clear on things like, let's say we got together and we were like, no, like anything that is anti-Black, um, um, let's say anything anti-Black um, sentiments, so on and so forth, um, issues around education, what that will look like. We got really clear on those things and we're united on it. That would be really powerful. Um, and I think we've yet to really do that, to be really clear on what our agenda even is. So. You know, oftentimes we talk, we debate, we march, but the action is missing. Yes, I, I agree with uh, both the sisters. When I hear uh, Black solidarity, um, uh, uh, Baba Jumai, uh, his definition for Pan-Africanism comes to mind. Baba Jumai defined Pan-Africanism as the consciousness of a necessity for a solidarity amongst all Black people because of the inextricability of their destinies. And so, like Malcolm said, like whatever is happening to you, if it's not already happening to me, it's coming towards me. Whatever is happening to me, if it's not already happening to you, if it's not already happening to you, it's coming towards you. And so, you know, it behooves us as a global people um, to think with one mind. Yeah, peace. I, um, I I totally agree with with my colleagues with with what they said, and um, and I would add, um, black solidarity means for us to be race first. You know, what I'm saying that's a really great vibe and a great concept that you know Marcus Garvey and the UNIA introduced. And to be race first mean that we owe our loyalty, our dedication, and our allegiance to the African race. And how that translate concretely mean that in our own personal life, um, we have to be involved in anything and everything to the greatest extent as possible that support the legitimate interests of African people at home and abroad. It means that we rooting for black people. It means that we are partial to black people. It means that we just put forward that extra effort at all times to be about black people first and foremost, especially us going for our legitimate interests to be liberated. That's what black solidarity means to me, meaning that we are partial, we are biased even to our own people, to seeing our people win, to seeing our people advance, to seeing our people safe, seeing our people flourish, race first at all times, everything that we do. May I please, um, I wanna, I really like that. So may I please add something? Is that okay? Oh yeah. I mean, when he was talking, I wanted to add something, but it's- Yeah, like, cause I really like that. I, and I think we have to be unapologetic for, about it. I think sometimes when, even if we are amongst um, like a mixed group or whatever, and, and you have some black person who will be speaking very much so like race first, there's always someone or apologizing for that, right? I'm um, like, no, but I like you. And, and and I think that gets in, and not that we don't love everybody. And I try to remind people of this, anywhere you go, you will find black people are so loving, kind, forgiving, all that. So we are those things naturally. And we don't have to like apologize for saying, yes, I'm about the business of making sure my people are good. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, so I really appreciate what you're saying. And I think what your point about it being like at the individual level is so important. It's like everywhere you go, every one of us, if we were united in this, this entire world would shift. So thank you for that. I just want to say thank you. 
So I do agree with everyone. Um, but when I think about black solidarity, I begin to wonder when this will occur. And how will it occur if we as a people cannot even truly express how we feel? As soon as we begin to say how we feel, we have to be apologetical to someone else because their feelings are hurt. We cannot at any point raise something about slavery without someone saying, you know, you're touching me. It's hurting me. Yet, we cannot say something about any other group of people without us being attacked. So unless that playing field is leveled and we begin to love ourselves so that we can learn to love each other, I am longing for the solidarity. And I know the conversation begins with each of us as individuals, but when one person comes out and try to defend us as a people, the repercussions become tremendous. So we need economic stability first, I think, you know, or together in order to get that solidarity. Thank you for those answers, uh, very powerful answers, thought provoking, and I'm sure uh, it's probably sparked a lot of uh, questions and comments. So. Um, at the end, we definitely are going to open it up for, for um, everyone in attendance to engage with the panel. Uh, so uh, I'm going to move to the next question. Thank you for, for um, fleshing that out, what it means to you. Um, in regards to education now, uh, what are some of the issues that you have with the current state of education for Black children? Um, and I'm making that assumption that there is an issue that we do have and um, some things we want to change. So, um, you know, and you can start off. I'll go. I have a lot of issues with the education system for Black students. And I'm going to begin from the perspective that I believe Black students need to understand finances and finances within education. I believe that needs to be a part of the curriculum for black students so that they understand the balance of power and understand spending ability and understand what credit means and understand ownership of business. I believe that that should be a part of the schooling for the black kid. I also believe that the black kids need to be taught the truth about our history. It needs to be said and students need to feel connected to the curriculum. We force black students into schools and they're uncomfortable for eight hours every day because they hear things that they know are not true. They hear things that they're not connected to. They feel, they don't feel the energy or the love from people. Sometimes we look exactly like them. And you know, it's always that that battle and that struggle for some um, for what they really want. Black kids need to also see the benefit of an education because as we became educated, the student loans became aggressively more, and then other people just felt they can. They do not have to become educated. They just have to lend us $5 and then they can end up with $300 from that $5 based on the student loan um, issue. I also believe that our homes are not the um, spring off. It's not our first class room. And that's because a lot of times the struggles are, even if you're middle class, you don't spend enough time in the home because you are hooked on the job. So slavery has now removed itself from chains and it is now based on our money, based on our earning. And because of that, the education of the black child suffers. Then our schools, um, you know, they put these test scores and because our children come in and they don't have that first class room very often, no fault of their own, the principals are now forced or the educators within the building are now forced to remove 
art. Remove something that they would enjoy and give them more reading. So they become now not interested because it feels like punishment. Learning becomes punishment for them. Then, I mean, there's so many, then in that same paradigm, you try to attract black teachers to teach black kids, but why would these teachers remain there if their scores do not look well, even though they're working hard and the system is not designed to see the impact that they have on the kids. So now you remove them and they always have to have a series of new teachers, now trained people coming in to work with them with no experience. So there's a lot that needs to be fixed in terms of the black kid being educated correctly. Thank you for that. Um, so in my class, I have a class that's the sociology and history of education or public school education. And one of the things that um, we look at, I have this book that my students read is called The Lost Education of Horace Tate by Vanessa Siddle Walker. And it is about Horace Tate, who was uh, a principal and educator um, in Georgia before segregation, before desegregation, before schools were desegregated. And it really dispels a lot of myths about how we were educated when schools were segregated then and we had our own schools. And they were very clear. You know, the way they educated students, it was for democracy. Students were in those classes learning to uplift the Black community. They were loved in a profound way. They were educated by the best and the brightest. Many of those teachers held PhDs teaching elementary school te um, students. And it was, the, again, it was much, much clarity. When Brown and what Black parents wanted was not, it was never to go to white schools. That is such a misconception that the mainstream, um, the mainstream narrative said that was never the issue. What they wanted was schools with heat, right? Like really simple things, schools that had heat. Um, they wanted to be bused to school if they lived far, right? They wanted the best textbooks, great libraries. They wanted equipment and good buildings, things that we're, we still want now. And with the advent of desegregation, because schools were never integrated, what happened was you lost all these excellent Black principals and educators because the Black leaders were not able then to go into the white schools. They were not having that, right? And I'm speaking factual history here. This is not made up. They did not want that. And so you see the demise of the education that we received. Um, the education was more holistic then. And I do agree that the arts have been taken out. You know, it's more so about rote learning in most schools where our children go to school now. There's hardly any creativity. There's no space to think critically. And um, there's no way that the knowledge is not being integrated. And so you ask the student, I can ask my student really simple questions now, like what percentage of something is something, just we're having a conversation. Most will not be able to answer that as adults because the way you learned in school was, it was, you know, nothing really meaningful. And I was telling a parent um, who goes to, her child goes to um, a private school and a very good private school. And I was telling her, I see the discrepancies early because I'm in the public schools and I'm in the private schools. I'm in a lot of different schools. The discrepancies start very early. I went into a school one day where three-year-olds had a tricycle like um, ring, like they, you know how you have like a track thing. They had that with a tricycle. They had 12, um, the ceiling was like 12 feet high. The, the space was beautiful. Oftentimes our children do not go to schools that look like that. They go to schools with 35 students, very small hallways. So even that your brain can't even think. If you are walking in a hallway, if you are in a classroom with 35 students, you even begin to shrink. You don't open up. Um, and Amos Wilson, again, what I'm speaking is factual research. Amos Wilson talks about the brilliance of the Black child, that Black children actually are advanced compared to every other race when they're young. And somehow 
it, 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 they either decline or it evens out. And I see this with my own children, how they walk earlier, talk earlier. And I don't think they're like unique or exceptional. I really think this is the norm. Um, but again, like what um, Dr. Michelle was saying with how you're socialized and how you're schooled, it, it really is a problem because a lot of times if you want to go to a, a school that's going to give you a well-rounded curriculum, it's unfortunate. There aren't a lot of Black children there. So then you suffer with that. Right. And then the schools where we are that we are in, they're doing the type of learning that keeps us dependent upon a system that keeps us as consumers and not creators. And we are creators. Like, I don't know how many of you know this, but when black people started to boycott, young people started to boycott TikTok and was not on it, it almost shut down. OK, that's what we do. We are creators. If we were to leave these United States. The country would not last like it really it would not it they, we would see the demise of the United States if we left. So we have to educate our children to know that they are genius. They're geniuses. Right. And have the type of education where they are thinking and they're allowed to to be their full selves. So there are many, many, many issues and there are issues on charter school, pu public school, private schools. Like I want to say. Like now that I've seen so many schools um, and across the U.S., I'm very clear that, I, you know, it's not there are myriad issues that that we have to address. Yes. Um, just to add on, I think that um, what, 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 is, what, what occurs to me is that. The way we conceptualize education has changed. Education in our civilizations in antiquity seemed to be a lifelong journey about the development of the human spirit. And now it seems in this society that it has devolved into something that we only do in a building called school um, and the only time we want to go higher or pursue higher education is if when when it when it when it comes along with a raise <laughs> you know i'm going back to school to get my masters why well it comes with 20,000 more dollars i'm going to go back to school to get my doctorate why cuz it comes with another 20 40,000 more you know um and so, you know, I'm talking to my students and my big thing is about literacy, like reading is really, 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 really important to me. And, you know, I'll be telling my, my students um, about reading and trying to get them to read. And they'd be like, I'm not in school. And sometimes I call them on the weekend, like, they'd be like, I'm not in school. I'm like, what do you mean you're not in school? So you're not going to read because you're not in school? And I think, I think there's just a disconnect there. So that's what I have to say. I think the way we conceptualize education and then us not pushing our children to be readers, like Mega Evers is right in Crown Heights. I live on Union. I live on Union of Schenectady, right? I'm one block away from the Hasidic Jew community. The Hasidic Jews, you will see them reading while walking down the street. Constantly reading, you know? And I think if we can push our children um, to look at education as something that is not too not that, that's not K through twelve. That's not um, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. That's not postdoctoral. That's a lifelong process. Like these, the ancients study for forty years. They would study for forty years before they could teach. Forty two years. If we can get them to realize that education is a lifelong process, um, and we can get them back into reading, I think we could do some powerful things. Mm -hmm. If we could really push an agenda that's centered around getting Black kids to read. And um, I would just like to add on just to um, what the other three panelists said, um, Dr. Michelle, um, Dr. Tabor, and also um, Brother Nemo, in terms of, you know, the purpose of education and how we look at education, I think that part of the issue adding on to some of the issues that we already talked about is that we don't control the schools that the, that our children go to. And so in 
we're not able to say we want it to be holistic. Now we are able to say we can, you know, as a community decide that we want to put pressure on those public schools in which our students go to in order for them to teach the type of education that our students need. But we know that you're going to get that same pushback that we've been getting for hundreds and hundreds of years. The issues that we're talking about today, we know are not anything new. These are just the same issues that have con con um, uh, persisted for so many years. And so I think that, you know, the lack of control to just to add on to what we've been saying, the lack of control of our school, of the schools that our students go to is one of the main issues. Um, as Malcolm says, you know, it's a, it's a fool who sends their children to be educated by the enemy. And so I think when we see all the issues that we have with these schools, it's because that is exactly what we've been doing. And because of the lack of control that we do have. And so um, the way that the school system does teach, you know, a Eurocentric, when I used to teach social studies, that was one of the things that I always worked to um, make sure that my students didn't get was this Eurocentric curriculum that praises Europeans while, uh, you know, picture, you know, painting a picture of African people and our history as uncivilized and uh, in need of salvation. And, you know, Europeans is the best thing that ever happened. And so that type of education not only fosters the anti-blackness that everybody else within the school system in terms of every other race um, goes ahead and internalizes, but we also start to internalize that same anti-blackness as well. And so then, then we do not see ourselves as getting education um, or education as something that's holistic and that is for our community and to nation build. Um, but we see it as something that's individualistic, but also something that is not really important to moving forward in terms of um, the importance, like brother was um, brother Nemo was saying, in terms of reading or or you know being able to hold on to those skills um, that we know we naturally have that uh, natural genius, as um, Dr. Tabora was talking about. So I think like just to add a little bit to that, those are you know some of my two cents. I just wanted to stick something in here and to be the devil's advocate. Um, Brother Nemo, you know, the largest education system in the US does not give you more money for your doctorate or your master. So just so you know that. And then secondly, um, would you or would any one of us want to read the story of the monkey that depicts me as a monkey? Would that interest you? I mean, if it wouldn't, that's one of the reasons why our kids do not really want to read because they recognize that the literature is not exactly the truth. So, you know, we, we, we can force them into reading or we can make them read. Reading is nice, reading is fun, reading is good, reading is needed. But we also need to ensure that we're exposing them to literature that is accurate and that they can now be able to debunk theories that are not quite true. And then to the point of Tabora, um, in terms of the school systems and um, the difference in the school systems, I myself struggled with that for my, my child, my, my all of them. And my decision became, I'm gonna send them to the black school because I did not want their thinking damaged in these schools because sometimes your kids come back demoralized and defeated because of the way they are treated all day, 24 hours, but you think you're doing good by them and they're not really educating them. So, you know, it's such a, it's such a, it's a problem. the time you did you want to i mean i'm loving the uh, I, I hear a wonderful analysis i think what i'm hearing is that we are really clear about the we clear about the big picture the big pr picture is that our people uh worldwide are held as oppressed an oppressed nation a colonized nation um for the purpose to to extend to grow to sustain the white imperialist world and the white imperialist population. And within that bigger picture, the schools step in as a small microcosm of a arm as a tentacle to replicate, to support, to push that single agenda. And ultimately, um, what I'm hearing is that even though um, wherever we at, whatever position we may be in, 
we're going to do our best to try to be black, to try to be revolutionary, but ultimately we must separate from a system that's an enemy system, that's a genocidal system to us. And ultimately we must have our own. We must have our own school system and we must have our own uh, educational ideas. And I, what I hear too, is I hear, I hear the lifting up of our culture because we have to understand that this contemporary uh, regime that's put upon African people, that's not our culture. That is a, a, a product of the imperialist domination on our people. When you, you know, as a young brother mentioned, we are the people that establish education. We are the people that has been the most literate people in antiquity and throughout times. We are the people who built whole cities devoted to study. That's our culture. Even when we talk about black people here in the United States, it was already brought up. Um, we were, it, in, in modern history, there never been a people that has been clamoring for literacy, for education. There's never been a, a, a more tremendous education movement than the movement that we've seen post-enslavement. So for example, um, the Japanese after World War II, they read Booker T. Washington up from slavery as a manual to rebuild their nation. That was their inspiration. Their inspiration this meeting is was being recorded. these African people, these black folks, um, who, who, who were so thirsty and so hungry for education. We took barns, we took shacks, right? So all of the solution for us is in a renewal of our tradition, right? Because there's a strong wind that tells us that we have to be hippies, we have to be white people, we have to start from a blank slate, but that is a lie. What's needed is a revolutionary anti-colonial struggle that's dedicated 100% to independence, to protection and security and growth of African people, but we can find all the answers in tradition, our tradition, our tradition of education, of literacy, of critical thinking, of teaching each other, and we must make the whole entire community into a school. And we must see everyone as someone who can be a student and also someone who can also be a teacher. So I just say bravo to my colleagues on this panel. I'm, I'm loving the clarity that I'm hearing. Let's renew revolutionary African tradition. Let's renew tradition. All of the answers is in tradition. Uh, thank you, brother. If, if I can add as well, um, I teach at a independent um, black nationalist school. It's called the Zyax Institute in Brooklyn, um, New York. And um, when I said, you know, reading and um, uh, Dr. Lourd um, said, would you read a story? What was he said? Would you read the story about the monkey wanting to be the monkey? I don't know if we can use that excuse anymore. You know, I don't know if we can use the excuse that we don't have representation in literature or that there aren't any books um, that represent us properly or aren't, doesn't, that do not represent our history properly because my room is full of them. You know, Zora Neale, Hurst, uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, um, Alex Haley, um, Amos Wilson, Elijah Muhammad, um, Franz Fanon, you can go on and on, George Jackson. We have the um, literary resources. I think the parents are not engaging their children in the way that is necessary, instead of parenting and actually uh, um, um, inculcating our children with a literary culture, we give them computers and tablets and, and a bunch of other devices and then make excuses and then go off to work. That's, so what, I, that's what I've observed. I, I just wanna say that one of the things that divide us is pointing our fingers, right? And without understanding the struggle of our own, we begin to tear them down and critique them. So I am not for one moment going to blame my parents because I know that the curricula does not have the books you are speaking about in them, okay? I may have them, some of them or all of them. I may have been exposed to them and many of us on the panel may have been, that's why we're here, right? But 
it is not something that is taught in schools. And when we want, and, and that's not the first set of books that our kids are reading in schools. And I will not say a parent is lazy if the parent has to choose between teaching their child or and working, right? To, to ensure that that child has a roof above their head. I will not start by pointing a finger at the other person, but rather encouraging them to see where they where I can get them to go, because very often we happen to be learned and we forget the struggle or we forget the, the, the things that people are going through in order to make ends meet, or the parent may not know to read themselves. So they may be unable to teach that child to read and you surely don't want the child not to respect their parent a little later. Now, with respect to the computers, I believe and I would really love for every one of the children in my school to have a computer at home and in school, because I believe there's a lot that they can get from the computer. And I believe that those young kings and queens, if educated correctly, and if really told the benefits and the negatives with respect to things, I believe they're going to make better choices. But very often we keep it from them and we make them feel as though this is a luxury and the only thing they're exposed to is the social media and the bad of the computer. But there's a lot of good with the computer also. And that's one of the things that keep our kids back. So if we, if we wanna be unified, we have to love our brothers and sisters to the, to the faults where we, can, where we can get them to understand, listen, man, sister, you could do this differently you know, rather than, yo, what are you doing? You know, two different approaches. Yes, ma'am. Right, thank you. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in for, for a second. So, hey, I'm moderating myself right now. I've been ready to jump in and well, say I get it, I get it. I just, I just, I just, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, with one of these other questions, we can circle circle back around to that. And I, I definitely want us to think about uh, the, the solutions to these problems. And I've been hearing solutions too. Brother Tommy brought up some solutions and, and I think I've heard some solutions in all of your answers. Um, but uh, we're gonna uh, think more about that. So before we leave this discussion, people can walk away and say, okay, this is something that you know I can do. Uh, another question I wanna ask in regards to um, uh, formal education, uh, have black, people in the USA failed to develop positive attitudes towards formal education? If so, why? So have Blacks in the US, Black people in the USA failed to develop positive attitudes towards formal education? If so, why? Um, Dr. Uh, Tabor, I, I haven't heard her, her say anything before. So oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to, um, thank you for calling on me. So I actually have a whole paper. <laughs> that has some research about this. Um, I could try to find it and drop it in the mm -hmm. chat. But actually, mm -hmm. Black people in this country, out of any other group, um, Black parents respect education more than anyone. Um, and that's like across the board, across like economics and so on and so forth. Um, in fact, I would say that Black parents trust schools too much <laughs> because what happens is they're like, baby, you just go to school. You need to just go in there, do what the teachers say, and that's it. Just go ahead, right? Now, I, and again, because I deal with many different types of parents, I deal with parents who are all walks of life, all socioeconomics. And so what we don't, what we, I'll tell you what a lot of, um, for example, like the Asian community, when you go home, you are working together, like, like a Japanese families will do this a lot, not every single Asian, but like I could speak for like some, you know, again, what the research shows and what you'll find. Grandma is sewing something, mom may be doing something at a dinner table, like it's all learning. There's a lot of supplementing as well. Oh, you're not getting math, you have a math tutor. What our affluent parents do, um, across the board, I'll say, is supplement a lot. You are getting tutored left and right. So sometimes when you see a child doing well, it's, it's not the school. <laughs> it's not. It's all the supplementing that's happening. It's the summer programs that these children are in. And New York City has a wide array of summer programs. And they look different 
you know, in terms of access based on income, for sure, based on race, based on your zip code. So Black parents actually really, really respect education and teaching um, to, to a fault, to a fault where they don't see, like a lot of times somebody asked about charter schools, right? They in our community, I'll try to put this into my answer. I know people who love charter schools because they believe their children are getting such a fantastic education. Meanwhile, their children are being yelled at, oftentimes put in dark rooms. And I'm talking about right here in Brooklyn, right? We've experienced this. We had to pull our student teachers out of a school right here in Brooklyn. That was a, a it, and they call themselves African Center, but we found that they were they had corporal punishment. We could not have our student teachers in that school. And they had the students sitting in dark rooms. Meanwhile, those parents were loving it because, oh, my child is doing well. My child is behaving, right? And we we really have to get rid of this idea. It's like we, structure is good. Absolutely. You need structure, you need discipline. But the idea that learning looks like sitting down, being quiet for 40 minutes, regurgitating, writing like a paragraph that the teacher wrote or copying questions. That is like all you're doing is memorizing. And there's a place for memorizing for sure. But it's not true like learning and thinking. Learning looks messy. Even us as adults, when you're learning something new, it's messy. It's not linear. You're like, oh, I thought I had it, but I don't have it. Let me go try something else, right? That's what like learning looks like. So again, um, the research shows, and we can see <laughs> that Black parents actually appreciate and like formal education. And we just have to start to help parents understand. Um, and I agree with, with Sister Michelle that um, we, there's some teaching that we have to do, right? Where we have to say, if your baby comes home writing one plus one and just doing that for hours and hours, like, and if they could like recycle that, take, ask them, ask them, hey, if I had five apples and then I add six more, how many do I have? Like, if they can't do that, you know, then, then we can say, oh, wait, you really don't know this. So we have to begin to help parents understand what real learning looks like, as opposed to um, only keeping it at the memorization level and, and not thinking critically. And we have to give parents the language as well so that they know because they parents will think that these schools are fabulous because they got great test scores, so on and so forth. Some of the best schools in Brooklyn, best schools do not test at all from K through 12. There isn't a thing called a report card. And these schools, the one I'm thinking of, their graduates are like all Ivy Leaguers, right? And so I go on and on, I'm going to stop, but because this is quite nuanced and I think it is just this alone could be the topic. Like, what is a good education? That's the question mark that we first need to define and help parents to understand. Okay, I, 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 would, I would jump in and, and I really appreciate that. Um, to answer the question, you know, I would say that um, once again, um, we, are so for education. Now, the 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 the, the regime, the, the 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 culture that's imposed upon us, the culture that's promoted through the white colonialist media and neo-colonialists and Uncle Times and unconscious Africans, that particular culture, that particular vibe, yeah, that one right there may be one that devalues education. But the culture of the masses of our people which is still based on our traditional African genius. Um, that is still present. That is still present. That is still in our lineage. What's needed though is a revolutionary struggle in order to bring that out and make that the dominant culture, right? So we got three problems as, as African people here all over the world. Problems of consciousness, of ideology, right? strong struggles got to be waged in that realm because one of the contemporary things that we're dealing with is we're dealing with white ideology promoting itself as woke African ideology, right? We have a lot of this. We have a lot of encroachment of white reactionary ideals, Eurocentric concepts of this and of that promoting itself 
as black ideology. And that kind of goes back to what Dr. Michelle was saying. What's the use of having the black school if it's teaching white ideology and black face? What's the use of having black teachers if they teach in Eurocentric concepts, right? We don't want that. So we gotta wage a struggle and ideologic, ideological. We gotta reclaim revolutionary black consciousness, right? And we can unpack that of what that may mean. The second realm is the realm of culture the realm of culture. And um, I hope to get a chance to talk about the peace part because our whole conception is that we gotta be outside. We outside with it. We outside with it. We in the community with it. We disrupting the day-to-day the -day system with it. We, we, we are, are clashing with the powers that be with it. We are showing something. So we gotta, right along with a, a, a ideological and consciousness that must be renewed, we also gotta renew our culture. And then the third thing is in the realm of practice. And that's when it goes into supporting, sustaining, and building African schools. So I would say that the colonial, neo-colonialist conception that's promoted, they invest trillions of dollars here in the United States alone to keep our people suppressed. They do that. They do that in concert with traders in a fifth column inside of our nation. But, the, but anybody that's among our people, anybody that's with our babies, anybody that's with our men, with our women, with our elders, would know that our people love learning. Our people learn differently though. Our people claim her, even the young people with their phones, with their TikToks, with their social networks, that's a form of them clamoring for information, clamoring for connection. And in fact, that type of community of learners is more in line with the African style than a teacher standing at the head of the class. So I, uh, once again, brothers and sisters, we got to develop and strengthen our revolutionary movement against the old and for the new. That's where our interest is at, relying on our people who are ready for it. Yes, I agree. Um, also, to answer the question, I think that Young people are going to school and like um, the sister Johnson said that black people probably love education more than any other um, race of people. Like that's all we talk about. Education is the key. Are we talking about like the development of character? Are we talking about going back and retrieving African sacred science? Are we talking about like actually studying ourselves and building a community or, or do they mean education, getting a degree? Uh, I'm not gonna go there, I'm not gonna go there, but you know, black people say they love education. And I think that my answer would be that young people are kind of losing uh, faith in formal education because we have not seen the, the product of formal education transform the community the same way that young black people have seen that we're, we're we're one of the most religious people on the face of the planet we're the most spiritual people on the face of the planet but the same way that we have not seen these spiritual institutions transform the community and so we've lost faith in the spiritual institutions as well it's the same thing for for the formal education i think that um the uh so-called uh intellectual needs to come back to the community and really get engaged in the community in, in very simple ways, facilitating reading programs. Like um, um, Dr. Lewis said that we don't, uh, um, the curriculums don't have these books that we're talking about inside the curriculum. Well, damn the school and damn the curriculum. We can educate our children outside of the outside of the school. Just how the Jews and the Asians will send their send their kids to school um, to, to public schools, and then they have programs after and on Sundays and Saturdays to show them what it means to be a part of their ethnic group. The we black people can do the same, but I think it starts with um, the young black people who leave the the undergraduate program, who leave with their masters. They need to come back to the community and engage um, and engage the community. And I think I, I think um, there's I'm not gonna say we fail to do that. I think there's a wanting. I think there's a wanting for that. 
Um, just to add on, I think that also when it comes to how we feel about um, education, I think when your parents send you to school, you know, you're going to school because your parents tell you have to, and, and you know, you're open to learning. But as we were talking about before, when you're getting that education that completely devalues you and makes you feel like, you know, you can't, it doesn't make you see any possibilities. It doesn't actually even show you your current reality or what are the possibilities for what you can create for another reality. And so I think a lot of children and um, adults grow up as, you know, from children, from being children to start to be disillusioned with school because also this idea of like brother um, Nima was saying of going to school and getting a degree and then thinking that you're going to be successful is part of this um, myth of meritocracy that's pushed within the United States that tells you that if you go to school, if you work hard and you go get your degree, you're going to be successful, you're going to make it. But then, you know, a lot of us as black people, we do that. We spit, you know, we get those student loans, we go to school, we work hard, we, we get them grades. And guess what? We're still struggling to even use that degree that we have or get a job that can be able to support us or might have to work multiple jobs. And then eventually, maybe 10 years down the line, finally find a job that's in your um, field. And so you start to really question, you know, when as you become an adult and also while you, you know, are in school, you start to question then what is all of this for? What am, what am I doing this for? What is this education for? And it's because it's not really preparing us and teaching us about our power, our ability to, to create and the possibilities that we actually do have. It's not some, it's not an education that's empowering us. So I think when we become, when we start to become disillusioned as students within school, as I've seen, you know, working in the public school system, and also when we become disillusioned after going into higher education, it's because we're starting to realize what we can't necessarily put to words this myth of meritocracy that's being perpetuated to make us believe that if we just keep working at it for some somehow we're going to be accepted into the American society in a way that's going to benefit benefit us economically, spiritually, um, materially, and those things just don't come. 100%. And if I can, just really quickly, um, 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 Dr. Lewis said something in the beginning of this conversation that is really like spot on. Um, and I was reading about this um, in this book, it's called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual by Harold Cruz. And inside the book, he, he's detailing um, um, uh, Leroy Jones or uh, Amiri Baraka. And um, he's talking about when he came back to the community and he started to organize, he started to organize and he got the institution up and then he realized I need funding for the institution. And then he went to the state to get funding and then the state would give him funding, but said, yo, you can't do this, 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 and this. So his, he got the funding, but it, it, it defeats the purpose of the institution in the first place. And Dr. Lewis said that our, we, it starts um, with economics. And that makes so much sense because how are you going to maintain a school? How are you going to maintain a um, private school for black children if you don't have the funding. So brothers and sisters, I believe that we value education and I agree with everyone who said we really value it and that's all we have done. But let's look at the spiral that we find ourselves in and let's look at um, what our kids are seeing. So the first thing is, what is the first reaction when a black person stands up for themselves, even if the supervisor or the, the boss is black, the first thing they attack is your money. If you ain't got no money, they don't give no attack. But if they're paying you a salary or if, they, if, if you've signed something with them or anything like that, that's the first thing they remove, your money, right? Because that's all you got and we don't have a system where we have our own businesses that are supported by our own people. So we can say, take it and leave because you need me more than I need you, All right? So kids coming along, looking, I remember I started teaching uh, for a year, you know, my family insisted on us doing that back in my country. So at 15 plus 16, I thought for one year. And I remember a student saying to me, because they used to say little miss, 
Let him miss. Are you serious? You know how much money I make? You don't make that kind of money. Why am I doing education? Right? So kids look at us, they look at what we drive, they look at what we wear, and there's no incentive to become educated. Okay. My child lives in a house with two doctors and he says clearly, I'm not doing that. That's nonsense. It makes no sense. Now I, I'm saddened by it, but that's what the child sees. Then look at the other part of the system. The other part of the system says, if your parents are not working for a particular salary, then you will give you a free ride because the data and the statistics show that you will not graduate. So they will look as though they're doing something for us, but they're not. And then as soon as your parents are earning a little bit of money, not money enough to send you to the schools that they may have gone to or you may want to go to, they, you do not qualify even though your GPA is up for these scholarships, right? So we are in a merit of a, a real quadmire and we have to really detangle this and be very focused in how we will attack this issue. We can do pockets of things. You know, I can have conversations like we're having here. I can go out on the street to my people who don't really receive me because it is amazing. I, I'm in a school that is predominantly black. It's black on black, right? And you'd be surprised with the election with President Trump. My kids came to school and weren't speaking to us. They were very upset. They felt that we were the uppity Negroes who voted him in. That's their perception of us, right? No, I think I'm a humble woman and I'm really there for my kids, but that's not how they perceive us because that's the thinking that they have. So we have to remove that thinking. It is deep seated within us. So we're going to a community that is not necessarily receiving us. And, 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 and the master may come next door and they will feel that, you know what? What he has to offer is better than what I have to offer. So this teaching, you know, this, <laughs> Dr. Johnson said something earlier. I don't want to appear defeated, but we have to be focused on sm a small goal and then that win and keep moving it along that way. I can ask a, a follow-up question. Uh, to this question, uh, Natasha had mentioned something earlier in regards to um, uh, the resistance that will come with uh, attempting to to tell her education in a way that will benefit uh, black people, black children more within within the colonial system. You know, colonial education system is something that I heard right, which it is. Uh, unite with that. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. How do we get to the point of tailoring uh, a curriculum within the context of the public school system? Do you think that's possible? And if, if so, how, how do we go about doing that? Why is that the goal? Why is um, inside the public school systems the goal? Um, I would say I would definitely agree with you, Brother Nemo, that that isn't the goal. I think that um, when we're talking about tailoring, you know, the education um, that our students currently receive within the public school system, I think it's really nuanced, right? So I think one, and I just know this just because it's, you know, over at Teachers College where I'm at school, that they're creating this um, Black history curriculum for the New York City public schools. Um, and I don't know, you know, how many people know about it, but I know that they're trying to put the word out there and it's, you know, the Black Educational Research Institute um, that's doing it and they're, you know, and so they're planning to roll this thing out. Um, and, you know, I think I, you know, as part of what you were saying, Brother Nemo, we shouldn't look at that as the solution, right? And I can't even really speak to all of the whole curriculum because, you know, I haven't seen the whole thing. I know, you know, certain people who have created certain lessons. So obviously, you know, once we see the whole thing and i think that there's some kind of outline online you know we can save our our, our judgment for then but i think we ha we should not see it as the goal right but we know that because colonialism settler colonialism neo-colonialism all of the colonialisms are not they're not in the past right these are current things and so that we are continuing to fight and that our goal isn't to have our um these schools necessarily uh 
be the answer for our students. But in the meantime, and in between time, we're, we can do different things at the same time so that we know that the majority of our Black students are in public schools, right? And we're not finna go take them out of public schools right now. We don't have the independent institutions. We don't have enough independent institutions for us to put all these Black students into these schools and get the type of education that they need. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are the different ways in which we can do that? And so we know that when we're talking about organizing, right, community organizations, teacher organizations um, that support parents, that are in collaboration with parents, that are collab in collaboration with um let's say these, you know, academics and intellectuals that are in, you know, these positions of professorship or power in these different institutions, when we know ethnic studies um, and Black studies, the point was that you had this pipeline between the community and these people who are supposed to be in these institutions to be able to funnel those resources to the community, the resources, the knowledge in order for us to start to build things out. And so I think um, that it's a we have to do more than one thing at a time. We can't think that we can, it's only, you know, we have to get the schools to tailor to the education. Our babies are in there. So what is it that we can do right now, right? What are some of the things that we can do right now to make sure that those babies who are in those public school systems are getting something that is not demoralizing, right? That is that is not the lying and, and the whitewashing or the complete erasure of who they are. So we have to make sure we're taking care of them, but we also have to make sure that we're also building while we're while that is going on like you're saying you work for a uh, an independent school we need to be building more of those right we need to be building at the same time that we're challenging these schools and the way that we challenge them is what we're talking about today in terms of black solidarity between black teachers between black principals between community organizations right and making sure that we support each other when we do bring the fight because if teachers, you know, as some of them that I know who, who are teaching Black students about, you know, being African and who they are in their history are being fired. What are we doing? What are we doing to, to, to um, reinforce that? What are we doing to support them? If parents want to go and, you know, go into that school and demand that the um, curriculum be changed and that the students are getting a specific kind of education, how are we as a community really backing that so that those students who do have to be in public school right now are getting that while we're also building all of these other things and doing the supplemental work that we need to do until we get to the space where we can take all of them out, right? Until they have so many options and that we can just, like um, Brother Tommy say, have our own nation. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, Dr. Michelle brought up something earlier that's so important. She she mentioned financial literacy, you know, um, we cannot we can no longer afford we i guess we never could but certainly now we cannot afford to separate economics and finances from the education discourse we simply cannot because the truth is the reason why people with some some parents would like to take their children out of public schools but they simply cannot um, and and nor do we have sometimes we don't we don't have the financial capital or the energy energy is capital too right so because people are like working so hard and you don't even have time again time and space to think time a lot of times what you're buying is is your time so many parents don't have this I think part of the conversation I know we probably may not get to this tonight but really we have to start talking about economics start talking about finance and make that a serious serious conversation many of our black leaders died without a dime where the community had to pull together to bury them and so on and so forth and we unfortunately don't even have that type of community nowadays like you know so so we have to start integrated into these conversations about education we have to integrate finance as well i was uh to add on to that, um, to your point, um, um, Dr. Johnson, about we cannot separate finances from education. It, it's uh, I was talking to Baba Seku Odinga um, maybe about two days ago, and I was asking him, I said, how did you guys run, uh, you guys I mean the, the Panthers, the Black Panthers, how did you guys run those free um, breakfast programs? I'm like, how did you run those breakfast? He said, it's very simple. We went around to the businesses that were in the neighborhood and we demanded 
subsidy. And if you if you didn't give something, you had to go. And so I think that um, I think we can do two things. Well, maybe three things. Um, one, I don't think that. And this might be very far to the left, but I don't think that we should be even entertaining of keeping our children in public schools, right? Or, or state public schools. I think that is very plausible that we can design a system where black children can go to public, private black schools, right? Where we can create a system where we can do a public, a public school system where it's a pay what you can program. And we are we get money from the businesses that line these streets. So I think um, one, the first thing I think we can do is centralize the existing independent institutions um, and have them pool their resources to develop mutually and then lay a foundation to replicate themselves. I think there are a lot of black in, um, independent black institutions. I mean, uh, me and a couple of my cap comrades are actually creating a campaign to um, um, fund to raise fifty thousand dollars to give to four of them, and these four are in different states. And there are there are a lot of black independent black institutions. The problem is these institutions are not centralized, and so. Uh, 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 they cannot support each other in the way that they need to, like Nation House. Nation House is one of the oldest black um, independent schools in America, in Washington, DC. It's really old, it's really well established. Going to Baltimore, um, Kimoyo Shule Africana, which is a independent school that Baba Imhotep just created. It's so new that he doesn't even, he, he only does classes on weekends. Why are the why is there not a centralized system of independent e black education where schools and, and institutions that are already established can help create and replicate themselves? That's one. Two, I think that educators and um, um, intellectuals or academics or whatever you want to call yourself, adults can take two hours out of your week and operate reading programs and math programs. I think that's very plausible. And then three, we need to, like the brother, um, um, like the brother uh, Tommy said, we really need to, uh, we're really at a crossroads as a people, in my opinion. Either we are going to be revolutionary or we're going to be reformatory. I, I, I'm not the arbiter of, of ultimate wisdom. I don't think that we can do both. I don't know if we can do both. I think we're gonna have to pick a road and stick to it. Either we're going to create our own systems and divest from the ones that do not serve us, or we're just gonna buy into the system and go down with the American ship. But uh, uh, um, uh, the latter, the revolutionary route, I think, I think that's the route that we need to go. And I think that, we're just a little bit unorganized. There's no reason why, why I'm in New York and all these corner stores and all these Jamaican food spots and all these, all these McDonald's and Wendy's and black people cannot put pressure on these businesses to pay taxes and, 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 um, um, and, and uh, disperse these taxes to the institutions that give back to the community. It just speaks to our lack of organization as a community. And Brother we, Nemo. So great I, ideas I will, except for the taxes. So let, let, let's begin to look at where our funding comes from, right? In our community. I'm just gonna build a, a cross section of a community that we live in, okay? We have a black doctor, we have a black nurse, we have a black pharmacist, we have a black teacher, a black principal, black kids, okay? A black corner store and about 10 persons that are not really working, but they get money from the welfare system. So I have this great idea. I'm gonna pull everybody's child out of the public school and they're gonna pay me, okay? The public school is funded by the federal government and the state and they give it funding in order to run the school. So the state and the federal government says, well, you're taking your kids, so I'm gonna take my money back and the parents said, no problem, take your money back because we're gonna pay for our children's education. 
And they said, oh, really? That worked for two months. And then they said, the principal's job is gone because I pay you. So no, find your own job. The teacher's job is gone. The pharmacist was working at a Caucasian pharmacy who is benefiting some other way, you know, because money circulates in a particular way. So they all pull back. So we don't have no money to fund this. And that's what a radical movement really brings to us. Now, I'm not saying we should not be radical and we should not be passionate about what we are doing, but I'm saying we cannot attack systematic racism by just going in and saying, you know what, wash everything. It sounds brilliant, but in actuality, when we begin to put the pieces together, unless the masses of us have our own businesses that a stream of people who don't look like me are coming to me for their food, they're coming to my pharmacy, they're coming for these things to us, I don't have that power to just decide. Just look what's happening right now. Where is the Nets basketball player? He was rich, right? Where is the other one? What is it? Yee or whoever? They were rich, right? That's not generational wealth. That's not old money. We have new money. There's a big difference. And that is why I opened today with speaking about financial literacy, because it sounds brilliant. I would love, I mean, I'm a culturally responsive school. You're welcome to come and see it, brother. But I have to operate within a particular parameter. And I have to push the system as, as best as I can to facilitate my kids. But I can't get radical and say, you know, I'm not teaching this nonsense. <laughs> I really can't, right? So there's a reality. But the tutoring, I love it. I wish we would give our time. That would be a great start because the more of us that can teach kids and bring them in, you want to do a tutoring system? I am in Crown High, just the offshoot, Ocean Hill, Bronxville. You are welcome to do it at my school. I would love that, okay? Come, start a tutoring program. Give me two hours a week. I, I have kids for you, man. Just come, all right? I was going to ask, brother... Nemo, and then now Dr. Michelle, if you can drop the names of like your schools and that organization, um, the you were saying, you know, you're raising funds, like let's take some action, put the name of your school so that people know, like if you want, I actually live in Ocean Hill, so I'm, I'm interested to know your school. Um, and then Brother Nemo, what's the name of your school and the organization, you know, because so, I, I think a lot of people here would very much so love the idea that you talked about like if we had this type of public private african center institution I, I would love that a big part of the issue is organization i call the african centered school nearby to get a tour for ne for my child for next year to go to school next year and they're like oh we're not doing any tours now like what, what do i do with that the other schools i have to apply now so i cannot wait until april that's ridiculous. Like by then, you know of all the other decisions with every other school. So a, a serious part of our issue is indeed organization. You know what I mean? Um, and, and we lose out on great opportunities because of that. So if we could <clears throat> drop the names, you know, in the chat, that would be great. I am a public school yeah, principal. Mute. I just put the... You're, you're on mute. Okay. I'm a public school principal. I just put it in the chat. Wonderful public school. You can come and see. I educate my young kings and queens. I am very proud and happy for them. Yes, we lose some. Yes, we gain some, but we do the best. And listen, come help me tutor them because I need that right now. I'll send some of my students over there. Yeah, can I? I, I want to yeah, jump in because this is a great conversation, yo. And I got three three main points. Um, this is a great conversation because there's a conversation that's in the framework of the, the Black United Front. It's very important that we establish that concept. Whenever Black people come together for any discussions about our fate, it must be a perspective that we are developing a Black United Front. That is very important. And that is tied to the concept that we started off with 
of black solidarity. That means that within the Black United Front, we agree on the big thing, and that is liberation for our people. And within this United Front, there are revolutionary perspectives, and there also may be other perspectives. But that's OK, as long as it's a healthy interaction and that we stay together to the extent that we don't compromise and our overall goals. So this is wonderful. And there's a lot of space for us working in the schools, out of the schools. So my three points are this. We must have land. We must have land. That is, that is the big piece of the puzzle that we are talking about. We are talking about land in order to go into and to develop economics. We are talking about land in order to organize our people into a better society than the one that's existing. We need land in order to do for ourselves. So black land is the context for everything that we're talking about. The second point that I wanna mention is once again, I stress, the answer is in our tradition. And what we are all talking about collectively, we are talking about maroonage. That is what we are talking about. We are talking about maroonage. Maroonage was a revolutionary perspective. It was breaking with the system. But the key dynamic about maroonage is maroonage was about how can we find a way in a hostile environment? So how can we go into the public schools, which are colonial schools, and do revolutionary work or bring revolutionary consciousness, right? So maroonage give us the answer of how we should move. So yeah, we go into the school, but we go into the school to try to do some good education and we go into the school to do like we're doing right now, to utilize our positions inside the departments, to bring together African people to have these type of critical discussions. We utilize being in the school to be able to invite the young brother to come into it so that he can teach those kids. We utilize our space within the schools ultimately though, to be very clear, to break them and take them out of them schools and to pit them into revolutionary schools. And just briefly, I wanna speak from practice. I wanna speak from practical experience of how in Philadelphia, uh, we have been solving these problems. In Philadelphia, we are uh, practicing what we call urban maroonage. We, we, we are moving in that tradition and we are operating as maroons inside of the city. And what we are looking at concretely in Philadelphia is we're looking at two zip codes or four zip codes. And those four zip codes that we live in, the two one zip code, the two, uh, the three two, the four, uh, the three one and the four one, you have 65,000 Africans, 65,000. 85% of these people are working class, but you also have acres and acres and acres of vacant land. You have scores and scores of abandoned property. You have 50, 60% unemployment, right? So that is an opportunity for us to organize. So what we believe and what we have done, we started to seize the land through revolutionary struggle, through protracted struggle. We took the land over. And what we started to do is we started to build new institutions on this land, starting with agriculture. And agriculture gave us, it allowed us to serve our people immediately by addressing food security. But the thing about agriculture too, agriculture is the foundation of an African educational system. Because when you're dealing with agriculture, you're dealing with mathematics, you're dealing with astrology, you're dealing with economics, you're dealing with sociology, you are dealing with science. So from the agricultural move, we engaged in a political revolution first because we had to, we had to, um, uh, we was under attack. Um, the system wanted the land back. The system wanted to suppress the rebellion Africans. So we had to wage a long political struggle in order to legitimize the revolutionary forces, not only to the masses of new Africans, but also to the system. But immediately what we did is we launched what we call the black market. Because now that we control land and we control buildings, which we seized through revolutionary struggle, that created the space for us to be unapologetic. You, you don't have to answer to somebody if you fight for it. If you fight for it and you gain it and it's legitimate, you don't have to apologize. And what we did is this, we started to develop small businesses in the community 
in order to create the tax base to support the school, right? We, uh, and I, I just wanna say this in, in, in conclusion, we as new Africans and as African people, one of the negative influences from the white left was that we were scared to engage in business because they told us that to be a business person, to, to develop a product, to sell and buy and to trade, they told us that that was capitalism. They lied to us. Knowing that we are the original socialists, we are the original communalists, we must develop a socialism-oriented Black business movement through a cooperative model. And this cooperative model, in turn, can support our institutions, right? So that's the thing I want to leave y'all with on this topic. We must reclaim maroonage. I encourage you all to learn from the Peace Park because I'm really learning a lot from you all and I'm going to visit your schools. I'm going to visit and I want to try to win y'all over because we need revolutionary black educators in order to have a school. But the key thing is we get to this land, we wage political struggles, we develop a cooperative or collective economic perspective where we share amongst each other on the basis of common ownership of the land and the tools. That's how we can develop a genuine economic base. It's not going to happen overnight. It has to be a protracted struggle to develop wealth. And then we also form the land trust so that we have a local government to uh, 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 administer the wealth and the structures. Yeah. Uh, can, can, can I, let me jump in here for a second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Anybody uh, else move into Philadelphia? Hey, hey, I'm, I I'm, go. I'm in Philadelphia and and I, I've seen seen the word. I, I was there, you know, years ago when it all started. And then, you know, just like seeing the development and, um, and uh, yeah, this is someone who's putting theory into practice. So uh, definitely appreciate you being on this panel. And, and there's some things that we can, you know, emulate in New York and other places. So um, yes, let's continue this build off this line. I kind of want to shift it just for, for a second. Um, and maybe we can circle back around, but I had a, had a question and uh, maybe we can start with Natasha. I haven't haven't heard from you in a while, so you're sitting over there. I'm coming to you, Natasha, all right? <laughs> uh, so I had a question about affirmative action. This is something um, that's been in the news. Affirmative action is once again under serious attack. Despite the obvious implications of this for Black admission into many competitive schools, there doesn't appear to be a sense of urgency in resisting this. What impact do you think a rollback of affirmative action policies will have on the black community? And um, there's a follow up question. Well, let's start with that. Like, um, uh, do, do I need to read that again or? No, I think, uh, yeah, what, cause I, I, I actually, um, I guess I was having a, I was, or in a small conversation around this um, specifically with um, indigenous people uh, of the Americas. Um, because I've been doing a little bit of work with them. And um, one of the things that they pointed out was that when affirmative action, and it was about like uh, Native students in college um, and their enrollment in college and, you know, how, how do they navigate it? And one of the things that they pointed out was that in California, where when they got rid of affirmative action, the uh, enrollment rate for Native students, right, Native Indigenous students, declined heavily. And so when we think about and has continued to decline. So when I think when we think about um, affirmative action and we think about black people, African people and what uh, impact that would have on us, it would have a similar impact where we would see definitely a decline in um, our enrollment. And I think it points to the buoyancy of white supremacy. Right. So that white supremacy or like better yet, white terror and domination. Um, when when it decides that it's going to to shift and move, it shifts and moves in order for it to make sure it maintains itself. And so I think that uh, of course we would we're gonna see if they do roll back affirmative action, we're gonna see a heavy drop in enrollment. I think um, in college enrollment, whether we're talking about um, 
community college, uh, just, you know, colleges and universities. I think we're going we're gonna to see all that. And I think it points to the fact that what we've been, all been talking about here and um, what the brother just mentioned, um, Brother Tommy, and, you know, shout out to the Philly Peace Park. You know, I attended the Black Future Land, um, Black Future Land Weekend, which was powerful. And it showed how what, you know, what we're doing, you know, across also, you know, they brought in different people from around um, the U.S. that are doing things around land, right? A lot, a lot of Black people. But I think that it points to the fact that we have to stop thinking that um, these programs that are instituted by this system are going to be something that we can count on and that are going to last. You know, this system is always going, this system of white terror and domination is always going to come back and redo the same things that it's been doing. And so it's it's about time that we start to think about, okay, what else? I mean, of course, we're going to be, you know, we have to be proactive. If we're thinking about this and we're questioning this, what are we, you know, doing, you know, as those who may be in institutions to kind of adjust and, and fight back about against these things? But also, what are we doing to do something that is different, that is that has nothing to do with these institutions and thinking about us creating institutions of, you know, what you call higher education that are independent as well. We all, a lot of times we think about, you know, K to K through 12 independent schools, but you know, what are the schools that we're talking about that are not like native Americans? They have these things called, um, uh, native American, uh, higher institutions, I forgot exactly the name, but they have these schools, these native American colleges where it's for native American students, Native American people are the ones that they say should work there, should lead there, should be on the board, should be everything that are independent. And so we need to be having some of those same things. And so I think, of course, we're going to see a drop in enrollment of Black people if they do roll back um, this, uh, uh, what is it called again, affirmative action. Um, I want to say real quick that we have those stats already because in California, um, and I've lived in California and I actually teach this in one of my classes as well. When, um, what was it? Prop 91, um, when it was passed to, to take away affirmative action, I could tell you there are two public school university systems in California, the UCs, the university of California's, and then just, um, the state colleges and in the UCs, a place like UC Berkeley, they're black, um, their Black enrollment is under 3%. Sometimes it's at zero or one. It's extremely low, very, very low. In their law school, some years they graduate, nobody Black, no one. So it is extremely detrimental. And if anyone wants to look at the UC demographics prior to the passing of the affirmative action um, proposition, you could see there are serious consequences for it being pulled back. But I love Natasha's point that, of course, the, it, I love what you call it, white terror and domination tries to, the whole point is for it to exist, for to protect white existence. And so we're, yes, I agree, we're going to see this. This is why it is very important that we protect our HBCUs, we protect our predominantly Black institutions, mm. such as Medgar mm. Evers College. And when anyone tries to change who we are or what we're doing, and I fight for this, like behind the scenes and in front of, in front of the scenes, that we protect this space for Black people because where else, you know, I, and I know we could build our own, but let, let's be really clear, that's very hard and requires a lot of capital. So while we're doing that, it's a both and. We, we have to start learning how to walk and chew. It's a both and. So while we're building, Let's protect what we do have. Like you can have property, but if you don't maintain your property and you're just trying to acquire more, then that's a serious loss. So um, we definitely have California to show us what happened. And they got very clever in California where for their people of color, they have a lot of immigrant, like Asian immigrants in like, I can speak to UC Berkeley. And so they say, you know, we are, we're majority, like a majority color or whatever. They got very clever about how they did it, but we are the ones who absolutely suffer. And although Latinos are the um, predominant group in California as a state, 
they too suffered tremendously and it's a very small percentage that um, will attend the UCs. So um, earlier in the discussion, I mentioned something about our love for each other and being able to value each other. Medgar Evers should be a staple in this community. I have very often said Medgar Evers does not respect their own degree because they seldom, or they used to at the time, seldom bring back their own people to teach, but they would go to the white institutions and take their people and bring them into that, it, not the white man necessarily, but a black person who has been educated there, right? The standards that we have for Yale um, and all the other um, schools were, are, are not our standards necessarily. And we have got to learn to respect ourselves and respect our own and know that we are producing quality and really work at producing quality. Unfortunately for the white man is that we are not starting from zero. So taking away affirmative action at this point should not push us back to where we were back then because we have so many people in positions who can decide my employees are gonna come from these schools, right? My, um, the people I choose are gonna come from these areas so they get the jobs before the other schools. And if we do that, then they would soon recognize that their schools really need to get us back. But we have to have that co concentrated, um, and we shouldn't even have to say it. It should come without saying that, you know what? My brother, I trust my brother or my sister more than I trust the other person, but do we? So those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Do we trust? That is why they can do these things to us because they know we are the ones clamoring to go there and think we are going to be educated better than somebody who's giving you all they've got and opening possibilities for you to really have more. So go ahead, take it. I don't wanna go there. I can go someplace else. You got, you got, you got Medgar. Medgar should now have an influx of talented people and then we can make a recommendation to now have a doctoral program right there, right? And we can build right there. So go ahead, take it. Then we shut your schools down because I guarantee you at the cost of education, that's not what they're doing, sister. They ain't paying for that. They're not. We're the ones paying for it. Oh man, hey, hey, hey Dr. Dr. Ken, we got, we got to bring Dr. Michelle into the mega. She got some great ideas. <laughs> oh, don't let her fool you, man. She's actually she's actually from Meg. Uh, and and the other doctor that she mentioned as in her household is also from Meg. <laughs> um, and, and in the defense of Meg, uh, Meg does actually hire a lot of its um its own graduates, not not always directly in, in the faculty. At this point, the whole staff should be graduates. It, it's damn near there. <laughs> well, I, I'm very, very happy for that. And I mean, this should continue. So Howard should do it. Um, so therefore, you you want to go to their school, then let them employ you. Right? And I'm sorry, I apologize to anybody who didn't go to a black school. I'm not, I'm not lashing at you, but I'm saying we need to love our own, right? You know, um, I'll talk about Columbia's reading program that they had, that they were pushing on the minority students. I've never had that program in my building. I got it free over the room across the hall because it does not speak to our kids. And, and therefore I would never use it. But everybody was clamoring for it until Chancellor Banks said, it doesn't work. Then now everybody's saying it doesn't work. We knew it didn't work before. So why didn't we stand up and say it's not working before, you know? So, hey, a lot of things are not right. Thank you, thank you uh, for that answer. Uh, I see 
Dr. Uh, Dr. Iris Bramble, I see you off of, off the of mic. You wanted to open it up for the questions now? Yes, I think we're going to do that. And um, I'm going to start it off with there were a couple of, um, of viewers who wanted to make comments or um, raise questions earlier. So I did take note. Um, so I'm going to ask Naomi Baptiste if you're still here. Yep, I see you right there. Um, so Naomi, you had a question or a comment you wanted to share earlier. Do you still have that question, Naomi? Okay, Naomi might have stepped away, so I'm going to go to who is next on the list, and I'll I'll circle back around to Naomi once she just raises her hand. If there's anyone else in the in the audience, uh, whether here on YouTube or uh, I'm sorry, here here in the Zoom or or on the YouTube channel, and you have a question, um, if you just raise your hand if you are. Uh, I know, Kumi, I got you. <laughs> I already got you. I told you I had you on the list. Um, just, you know, raise your hand in the Zoom or drop the question for me through YouTube. I am monitoring both, um, and I'll take you in the order that I see you. All right, so Kumi, um, I know, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, the, floor is yours for comment or, or a question. Okay, I have a, um, a question. Um, great evening, everybody. It was a progressive, like energizing conversation. Um, I'm grateful for everyone's contribution. I was on a Zoom call this year um, for the NAACP about the teacher shortage, the black teacher shortage. And I was expecting this conversation there, like, this is a situation that we are not now finding ourselves in, but we've been in and is now becoming dire. What can we do in our agency to change our situation? And it wasn't that. It was, and not to down to um, bad mouth NAACP, I work alongside them with the Axel competition for high school students. I commend every, oh, really tell all your high school students and middle school kids about Axel competition. Um, it's absolutely free. But yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a progressive conversation. It was um black people in their 30s and 40s coming together to really air their grievances and air their grievances. So my question is when is the next conversation? When is this next conversation going to happen again? Because um in the organization in the organizational space that I'm in, I very much agree that we need a system of everything a system of finances, economics, socioeconomics, socialization, education, healthcare, everything. Um, so when, how can we organize and mobilize all of our resources to one, know what people in our circles are doing to support and, and receive support when, when it's needed, but also act in a way that is, um, and Brother Nemo said it, duplicatable, a system that can duplicate itself, um, that can run efficiently, like, and it will take a lot of work to form, but how can we, when can we just continue the next conversation for that? Um, I guess I'll, I'm sorry, who wanted to go? Go for it. No, I was just gonna just say something really quickly. And then um, just cause when you were speaking, um, sis, I just thought about uh, in terms of what you were talking about, sometimes you do go into spaces and you're expecting a specific kind of conversation, especially when you're talking about um, the lack of black teachers and it's not there. And so one of the things that I, you know, would teach students when I was um, teaching social studies was that when we were, when we look back at our history, we see that we are not like stagnant in silos that, you know, you have Kwame Ture, you have um, uh, Martin Luther King, you have Malcolm X, you have these people interacting, not just nat nationally, but also internationally. And so I, I would say that like, we definitely, you know, need to have more of these conversations, but I would say that when you do get into a space and let's say they aren't having those kind of conversations and we we have tons of people here in this space that are having these conversations, how can you get these people and bring bring them together with those other people so that we can bring these people into the fold to have these conversations, but also provide resources, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know about a couple, one in Philly, one that's out of Philly, um, which is, I think the black male and uh, I forgot exactly what it's called, but it's as a former, um, it's a Panther cub actually who runs this program to get more 
black male teachers into the um, school system. And then you also have like, even when I was growing up, I had, there's a black woman in Westchester, actually here in New York and Westchester, who still runs a program that helps black um, students become teachers, get scholarships for school. And so we have these resources. What we need to do is be able to connect with each other. And so, you know, never be afraid to reach out or, you know, think about, okay, like what spaces have I been in where we've had these kind of kind of, kind of conversations that they may have resources where this space that I'm in is not really giving me the answer for, or gi giving me the resources because they might, they just might not know. So yeah. that, that's my one, one tip, um, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. It, can I also add on um, to assist Natasha was saying, um, I think that um, uh, w w educators, have to realize um, that they are soldiers and um, that they are really like on the front lines. And, um, you know, Thomas Sankara, when he was uh, during the Burkina Faso revolution, he did a complete overhaul of, bu uh, uh, of bureaucracy. He took away the Mercedes Benz and he replaced it with a cheaper car. Um, um, he, he, uh, he didn't decrease the salary of the bureaucracy, but he said, yo, you're going to make the salary of a person who does your job. If you're a veterinarian and you're serving in the government, you're going to make the salary of a veterinarian. Just because you're serving in the government doesn't mean your, your salary is, is going to go higher. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, when he started to reform the educational system of Ghana, um, um, and he had these standards he wanted to implement in the schools and the teachers that were already um, teaching under the colonial system, they had all these demands and all the, you know what he did? He fired them and he hired young, um, young educators who just wanted to educate the children. That's all that they didn't want money. They wasn't, they understood that they were soldiers and that they were on the, the front lines of, um, of a war. And so I think that, um, um, really, this is really for just black people in general, but I'm, we're speaking about educators. We really got to let, let go of the delusions of grandeur. And we really have to like s cut our budget our, that we, our life budget in half. We need to like stop driving the fancy cars. We need to stop having the 20 pairs of shoes. We need to stop eating out every day. We need to really cut our life budget in half so that we can be more affordable to our community. You are a teacher, not, not a celebrity. You shouldn't, okay, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say that we need to slut, cut our life budget in half so we can be more affordable to our community. Like, like Zayax. And brother, the teachers are celebrities, you know, the kids really think they are, right? Yeah. They're also entertainers, you know, they're edutainers. They have to really hold their audience. So, you know, there are a lot of things, but um, I believe that one of the reasons why we are unable to attract the intelligent black to our schools is because of the way the system is set up. So we bring um, them into the system and they feel defeated because they are judged based on a test score. So wherein they see this whole child that they would really like to mold and develop and they're doing an excellent job with it. And wherein they're planting seeds that we will see later on in life, they are held to these scores. Now, um, I wanna draw your attention to an, an article that was in the papers today that um, kind of tried to destroy Medgar Evers um, High School. And my child is gonna graduate from Medgar Evers in June. And I believe he has gotten a phenomenal education. I believe that he, he's able to graduate with an associate degree. He's able to um, have advanced placement courses and he has not even taken all of the opportunities that he has had and an athletic um, and he runs. So, I'm saying all of that to say, they said that the scores dropped the most. They dropped from 80 to 30%. All of that is true, but that 30% is on par or higher than the average black school because we are coming out of a pandemic with, that really showed the system for what it was. So the average black school that tested all their kids 
not those that hid, the ones that wouldn't perform. Dharma tested all the kids. The average schools that you, you may have blacks and whites in the school, but they tested who the kids who were more affluent. They didn't test everybody, right? So yes, the data looks bad, but that's not a reflection of the school. So figure me, a teacher in there doing all that I can. And now you are just talking about somebody who brought a gun into the school last week. I misdirected you to probably just need some guidance. And you are talking about test scores, but you are not talking about the work I do. So then I move myself to Queens or another affluent neighborhood where I have to do less work and I look like I'm a genius teacher. You know, so those are some of the reasons why we're not attracting these people to the profession. The profession in itself is demeaning to the Black educator. And we got to change that. All right, thank you. Um, I had a question from Alex or a comment from Alex. I apologize, I'm going to mute because I am typing in the chat as well. So I apologize. No, I appreciate that. Peace, peace, peace. Uh, definitely a powerful conversation. I appreciate everything that was said. I definitely pulling on Numi, uh, Kumi's question. Um, and I agree with everybody saying, I didn't really have a question, but just wanted to get that affirmation because, you know, we really, it is not a one-sided, you know, uh, a one-sided uh, task to do, you know, uh, and education isn't, you know, just, I think, you know, in this Eurocentric education, it's like, you know, math, reading or whatever, but like really our young people are just our communities too. We need a, a education and just like how to love each other. Like there's so much interpersonal harm because of our miseducation, but also because of like this, like our culture. There's no like we're losing our culture. So um, I definitely was feeling this conversation and hope for another one and hoping for like ways that, you know, we could, uh, get together and really make some, some possibilities. Thank you, Alex. Um, I, I do have a quick follow-up question for you. Um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Um, so I'll open it up to, to everybody, really anyone who wants to comment. So you made the, the statement that um, a Eurocentric education is reading you know, math and, and things of that nature. and. Um, and prior to that, Dr. Dr. Luard was talking a lot about um, the the data that shows poor test scores, um, and and in in the dialogue around education and race, um, you know the the whole issue of poor test scores or or poor reading scores or poor math scores. Um, you know, seems to always dominate the dialogue whenever we talk about um, people of, of African um, ancestry. And it's something that's always troubled me, right? It's troubled me from an institutional level. It's troubled me most particularly when I hear us echoing it. It's almost as if we have an inherent, even it even comes up in the conversation around affirmative action, right? Like, so in every conversation that we have around um, education, it always seems to be informed by this assumption that somehow reading, you know, performing mathematics, that these things are, are, are somehow some kind of challenge for us or that there's something that's being forced on us. But, you know, at the same time that we are sort of projecting that idea, then at the same time, we're also trying to promote a dialogue that we were the creators of these things, right? Like, like that, that, that we are the original, the Europeans learned mathematics from us, right? They still can't figure out how to build a pyramid, right? <laughs> that, that, that the numerical system, they gave up their numerical system to adopt a numerical system of, that they, they, they got from people of, of, of color. Right, people from the African continent. Right, geometry is not a European concept. Right, it's you know even the name is is has its Arabic and 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 other roots. 
So I, I'm always curious, why is it that we are so willing to embrace this idea? And I, I think, I really think it speaks to a lot of what came up, um, came up tonight. Why are we so willing to embrace this idea that somehow academics is difficult for us? Now, I definitely want to, you know, just comment to that. I appreciate that, brother. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely would, you know, I guess I would switch up some of my wording about, you know, saying Eurocentric. I was really getting at, and one, I definitely don't think the way we created, because yes, we created all of it. It's all us. But best believe the way we were teaching it is not the way they're teaching that. You know, and... Math has no spirit. They were just talking about capitalism. So definitely, I understand what you mean. This is definitely ours, but the spirit of it and the way it was taught is definitely not out. And then the next piece, I do agree. So what I was trying to get at is that we're so, you know, you know, our schools be one violating us about you know, a young person reading, they be having one, they be setting up interpersonal beef in the families. Like, like mothers having to, one, the school coming at the mother, like, oh, you ain't, whatever. And then the mother going home, getting at the young person. You know, but then also, you know, as I said, like, there's no cultural education center around how do we deal with our, 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 our differences? How do we deal with with stuff that's happening in our neighborhoods? How do we communicate like, like there's no education centered on courage, centered on when you see interpersonal violence or intimate personal violence, this is, this is who you connect, this is how you communicate, this is how we have circles, this is how we you know, address our, 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 you know, so I think also the school, that's why we, the school can't maintain young people fighting and all that shit because there's no spaces where we're just building about how do we be culturally together in this situation. Like this, yeah. So I can understand what you mean. And I was just trying to explain more of that. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. I really appreciate your comments. I'm sorry, is there anybody else? You want to Go ahead, bro. Yes. Um so um I between 2023, it's 2022, about to be 2023. Between 2020 and 2022, um, I've tutored about 22 kids, one on one tutoring. And um, I've spoken to parents um, of about maybe 40 kids. Like I'm, I'm talking to these parents. Um, and I'm working with these kids. And when you work with a kid, you work with their parent because tutoring, you only with me three hours out of the week. And um, what I've come to realize, and I tutor um, reading uh, comprehension and writing development, that's like my thing. What I've come to realize is that young black kids are not, the ones that I've worked with are not reading, comprehending, and integrating information at the level that they took to the full extent of their potential because they are not being engaged in a way that is conducive to this development. Now, I, I, you know, I did a little research and um, this information is coming from the, national, the nation's report card um, from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And this is a study done in 2019. And the study found that, 15, that just 15% of black eighth graders were, were at or above reading proficiency. And about half didn't even reach the basic reading benchmark. And so, yes, um, we are, are, are we in antiquity created um, these systems of being able to store information. Um, we we created it pre-literate, like before we even were using like letters in the alphabet. You know, using symbols and oratory traditions, um, being able to comprehend. 
we we created these systems, of course, but today, in 2022, um, it seems like our young people are being um, intentionally underdeveloped, um, not just in those buildings that we call schools that are a little bit more like prisons, um, but also in our homes, dealing with the parents. The parents are not implementing regiments that will develop these, these children. That's my first point. My second point is gonna be brief. My second point, I'm gonna raise a question. Um, and it's it's an extension of Alex, Alex's question. Is, it doesn't matter where the education is being um, had, whether if it's, it's, it's in a home, whether if it's in a, a building that's called a school, wherever it is, if it's a quality education, it has one thing, one theme. And that theme is, it is existential. It is dealing with the, the education of that of that being is dealing with how can that being exist in the in the surrounding environment. If your education is not dealing with that, that is a bad education. We have to tailor, in my opinion, um, we have to tailor our education and our lessons and the subjects that we teach and how we teach them to the absolute war that is taking on that is taking place around them and inside of them because you're constantly at war with the uh, with the african and the european that is a constant battle going on inside of you and so we have to teach our children the epistemological approach to judge something um african or to judge it european and when that's not being done and then we actually have to start equipping our children, um, 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 especially us as intellectuals and, and academics and, and thought leaders, we're the real thought leaders. We have to start equipping our young people with agendas and things that have to be done and things that um, um, need to be fulfilled and initiatory processes so they understand their roles in society as they go from age to age. One of the most important educational institutions in African civilization was the concept of the age grade. And it was the age grade, um, as you are initiated into the different age grade, you are, you are taught the political responsibilities of that age grade. And that's why a lot of for a lot of the period of, of our civilization, we didn't necessarily need um, centralized chiefs. And so in closing, we, uh, you know, adults and um, intel intellectuals and educators, we have to come together in, like brother um, Tommy said, protracted long-term um, committees and really start developing and 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 not just developing the program, but developing the program to implement the program for our children. Like this, we shouldn't stop. We should we should deem this a committee for this is the com uh, the committee for Black education on the uh, Northeast America, and we should meet every week. And we can come up with programs, and we can implement them. We can, we can, we can, we can come up with reading programs and implement them. We don't, I'm just saying we can do that. Like, and we should do that. We should, we should meet every, every week or two times, uh, every two times a, a, a month to create programs and to implement these programs, these educational programs and, and, and give it five to 10 years. We will definitely see what we want to see. And not just sciences. We, these kids need to know how to shoot. These kids need to know how to cook. I agree, and they can learn science in cooking. They can learn science in agriculture. Um, you know, I say to my parents, if you're doing ratios, and you know, when you're cooking, have them do the ratio table right there. Um, you know, we can apply it. And um, don't you love his passion? No, I love your to. passion. <laughs> but <laughs> let me just say something. Um, one of the reasons why those scores are the way they are, right? Um, again, I believe as a people, we point a lot of fingers. So what happens is the 
elementary school point to the parents, the middle school point to the elementary school, the high school point to the middle school, the college service, the high school is putting out, but nobody has taught the child yet, right? So um, our curricula was not aligned to, but when I talk about culturally responsive, right? You, you have, I'm, I'm going to address New York. We have a melting pot in New York. We have the Caribbean families. We have the um, Black families from the South. We have families who have trusted the school system forever of old. We have families who felt if they did their part in sending their kid to school, then the teacher would do their part. But the teaching system had switched. And nobody informed the parent that your child has to come in with a foundation, right? So we weren't teaching certain things here. And if the child didn't have that foundation, then the child operated from a defeatist attitude. So the child felt like I cannot achieve, right? And every day that you are told you cannot achieve and you are shown all the stereotypes of your race, like you gotta be this and you gotta be that. And they're not people like, you know, people are no different of your race. Like you gotta be a gangbanger, you gotta be on the streets, you gotta be a drug addict, you gotta, that's, that's the pictures our babies are shown. When they're shown those pictures, they don't come with, 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 with the, the resilience to really face the challenges. Okay, so when you come now as a person who looks like them and you tell them, no, baby, you're beautiful, you know, you're actually beautiful. They're looking like you, like, excuse me, you're lying to me, right? I've been told I'm ugly by my mother, my grandmother, my great aunt, my, my last teacher, my, you know, the, 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 the poor babies, we, I don't know, man, we, we beat them up, right? So we have to encourage them. We have to make kids understand at a very young age, you can do this. We have to stop shutting down their thinking, you know. The white child says, I can be Batman, I can fly. And the parent says, yes, baby, fly. We say, boy, sit down. What's wrong with you? You know, fly where? Sit down. There's not like fly. And then the child gets the fourth grade and you're asking them, can you imagine if you fly? The child's like, fly where? Sit down. That's all the child remembers, right? So we have got to change our language. It's a cultural thing, right? The kids go to a school where the people don't look like them and they're told, do you mind having a seat? And they said, no, I don't want to sit down. I'm upset. Because they, 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 they don't understand the culture. They're accustomed to you saying, sit down. That's the culture. We have, to, we have to really think about culture when we're thinking about education and the impact of the culture on the education. And yes, the data shows it. And yes, the statistics are there, but why? The, the system is designed to create the data that they are getting. And then we who slipped through the crack are designed to say, yeah, look at her. She won't pay attention to the 20 babies she's making, you know? Yes, you know, look at her. She want to be out on the street all the time. Look at her. You know, she, she bring them to school, kids to school without food. The system is designed for that. And we have got to work against that design. And that's a mental thing. All right, I'm just going to jump in really quickly. Um, so Akinshal, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but... Kinshal, you did have a question. Do you want to? Actually, I have a comment. I'm, I'm really loving oh, I'm what, I'm, what I'm looking at right and listening to because you all here are very smart. You all here have the answers. We just need to put the practice in the play. Right now, it's a collective. I listen at uh, the need to be independent, separate. Matter of fact, Malcolm said run <laughs> because anytime your enemy sets the barometer of play and you could never meet that standard. But what does that say to me? That says to me that I need to do something for myself. And you all right now, I mean, man, I, I've listened to all of you all. You all are, I said geniuses in our youth, but I'm looking at the genius of what you've done. We do need to work as a collective because definitely 
they want us to cease, desist, and become what? Genocided? That's where we're headed. So I just want to tell you, I really appreciate having been invited to this process. Hopefully I get invited again by Dr. Akimba or Jory. Who are you all? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have uh, any other, did I miss anybody? All right, so um, I think at this point, we're going to start to wrap it up. So for my part, I, I, I do want to thank all of you. <laughs> and I genuinely mean all of you. Um, the, the panelists, thank you for taking the time to participate in this conversation, this dialogue, which as uh, many people have said, is not a dialogue that should um, should end, right? This is, should be an ongoing um, uh, dialogue and an ongoing move, uh, call to action, let's call it that, an ongoing call to action. Um, and so, oops, somebody dropped a question in here at the last minute. I'll, I'll get back to it in a second. Um, I, I want to thank all of you um, who, who took the time to to join us and um, and to participate in the conversation because the conversation is not just <laughs> defined by the people who um, may be on the panel and and who are speaking. Right, um, you are as much a part of this um, conversation and this call to action as as they are. Um, hey, Kemba, my brother. Uh, I want to thank you for um, helping to assemble this panel and for um, taking on the task of moderating um, this discussion. As always, you've um, done an excellent job, a fantastic job, and um, must be recognized for that. And of course, um, I, I look forward to you and I working together on many, many projects um, uh, to come. Um, of course, I need to extend an invitation to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, my appreciation, excuse me, um, to Dr. Maria Delongoria and the Department for Social and Behavioral Sciences for continuing to work with us here at the Caribbean Research Center um, to bring you quality programming, to, to be a source um, for, for these types of dialogues and to you know, help us and support us in, in documenting this. Um, being said that, if you have not yet, um, please go to the Caribbean Research Center at Medgar Evers College YouTube channel and subscribe, right? Um, we, this is not a one-off um, thing that we do here at Medgar Evers um, and, and at the center. Um, we, we are always trying to have engaging um, conversations about topics that are, are, are relevant to everyone. Um, and we do go beyond um, to, to whatever capacity we can, go beyond the dialogue. Um, Dr. Johnson, for example, and I are, are working, developing resources for, um, for instructors, um, and we have numerous other projects which are going on. Um, so having said all of that, I, I, again, thank you for, for coming out this evening. Um, thank you for taking your time and your energy. Certainly a very passionate um, conversation and um i look forward to to some follow-up with you guys about um you know creating that committee <laughs> all right um uh, dr I Dr. Rambo, I, yes, I put a i put a um like just a sheet in the chat where i could collect everyone's email and I, i'll share it with you i'll share it with okay. every week Absolutely. Um, so yes, yeah, so for those of you on the Zoom, please, um, there is a Google Doc I, uh, I'm spotting here. And I did promise someone else uh, did drop a question. Oh, oh, it's, uh, Brother Nemo, you did drop. Uh, we are, uh... I, I also do think um, Naomi, who I think was in the beginning, she just asked, are you taking any questions? I know. Oh, she, Naomi, are you back? Uh, hi, Naomi. I'm so sorry. We did call on you earlier. Well, I, um, I would uh, thank you. Thank you so much for remembering me because absolutely. you probably was calling me, but I'm dealing with my children as well. Okay. I understand. So I had to move away 
And I came back, and I'm glad I came back because if I wouldn't have came back, y'all probably would have been gone. So, <laughs> hello everyone on the call. My name is Naomi Baptiste. I am um, a parent of this lovely community in District 17. I work with Dr. Michelle Luard, who invited me to this lovely panel. Um, I'm very, I'm very glad that I was able to meet some very positive intellectuals um, from the has Caribbean um, Black African background. And um, as a parent, we do not get this opportunity to share with many intellectuals. So I was very eager to ask a lot of questions in the beginning, but unfortunately, I had to wait to the end. So. Um, now that I have this this opportunity to make it very quick because I don't want to I want to respect everybody's time. Um, you had a lovely, lovely, lovely panel. But as me and Dr. Lawad had um, had a lot of conversations because I am a part of the Community Education Council for this district, which houses Mega Evers, which is district school district 17. You, there was a lot of statements made, and the unfortunate reason is that a lot of people who are educated um, and are Black, they turn back and do not come back to the communities that they once got all their help from. And some, and unfortunately, some of our intellectuals turn around and do not come and do community activism in the same poverty-stricken area that did uplift them to be who they are. So that's number one. Number two is that, yes, we have a lot of parents out there that are uneducated, right? But they do the best that they can with what they got. And we as, edu as educated people, because I do have two degrees myself, but that is a fortunate thing. That is a fortunate thing that I was able to do with John Jay College and with LaGuardia Community College. I wanted to go to Howard University, but unfortunately, my mother did not have the money to send me to Howard University. And I did not get a good SAT score because they did not have the credentials to teach me SAT. OK, I'm a product of the New York City school system. I have went to Maxwell High School in East New York. I have came from PS 221 in Crown Heights. That has a high Hasidic community. Hey, right? I went to 221. Yes, I yeah. am. A, I am an alma mater of 221 that used to have at least 2000 kids and now is enrollment of 173, unfortunately because they do not have any programs and the charter school is taking over, okay? Um, also, um, sorry to say that some of our lovely black educators tend to disenfranchise the parents because they believe that they're unintelligent. They do not know the language to speak. So they belittle the, the parents and turn around and make you feel inferior. And these are the people that look just like you, okay? And I can say that because I have been that parent and I am that parent as we speak. And unfortunately, if I do not come correct to the school and I am not um, sufficiently educated, I did have two ACS cases with all my intelligence and my, uh, and my education because I was going through something and it was used against me. OK, so it's sad that we say we say all this and we have all these lovely things. But who is willing to sacrifice their children? See, because I lost mine for 11 months. And I and I and they tried to terminate me because I was working for NYPD school safety at the time. And I have 19 years. But because but because of those things, um, Unfortunately, I was going through a divorce as well, but nobody didn't care about that story. All I cared about was that there was an accusation made that I sent my children with feces on them, that it was a lie. So I'm just saying that when we talk about all these things, are you willing to sacrifice your whole life to prove a point? And if you are, then come and join me because I'm on a community board for Community Board 9 because I have done it. And Dr. Lewad would tell you, I don't have a problem with saying what I want to say, but guess what? When I turn around, ain't nobody behind me except the 10,000 that's imaginary to bring me where I'm at. So I thank you for your time and y'all have a wonderful night.
Naomi, thank you, Amy. please thank make you sure that. you tell them I'm not a black educator and Miss Watson is on here. Well, first of all, Dr. Lewad, Dr. Lewad <laughs> is a rare breed because guess what? Before, but she's the one that invited me to this lovely panel. So that's how, that's the only reason why I knew it. But as I said, as I stated before, um, I'm on the community board. I am the chair for education and library. I do have some Dr. Lewad school is going to be a pilot program for my reading program that I, that I love to bring out. But guess what? Because there's such a school initiative to bring a literacy program, and unfortunately, because my perfume, which is my personality, doesn't rub everybody well because I talk the truth, and I can be an intellectual or a street person, the problem is, is that they already blackballed me. So um, guess what? When I turn around, I have the imaginary 10,000 that brought me up because my grandfather owned the building that I live in right now. He, he was a black man in 1980 that purchased a 24 unit building. And he also has 240 acres of land upstate in Delaware County. But guess what? None of that is mine. And nobody cares because guess what? In this community, a lot of Hasidics rule this community. And guess what? Tomorrow's a big voting day. But where are the people that's talking about where's to vote? Why the schools that have the the that have the election don't tell the parents to come out and vote? This is a very important election. And guess what? It's not being advertised as well. Because if you really look at it, are you really looking at the, the, the sacrifices people have to make? Do you do, is everybody aware on this panel how people have died and bled for to, to vote and nobody exercises that? So we got this panel up here and we're talking about black solidarity, but are you really ready to die for what you believe in? Are you really to, are you ready to lose your economic wealth because they tell you you cannot do it? Now, if you, you if you're down to do that, please join me because I already did. I did it and lost it and gained it back. But guess what? Everybody's not a parent like me. And I know my position. Now, the question to this panel is what's yours? So I love y'all. God bless. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Naomi. And on that note, we are going to uh, wrap it up uh, once again. Um, uh, uh, happy. I, I don't want to say happy Black Solidarity Day. I don't know what we say, but you know. <laughs> Black Solidarity. Uh, let's, let's leave it a power to the people and just leave it at that. How about that? I can't but... The war continues. <laughs> That's F right, man. Revolutionary right. Black Solidarity Day. Appreciate everyone, and um, and, and just a quick follow up, like the uh, uh, the the panel. I, I think everybody's willing. I I know some of these people from in the streets in the community putting in work. <laughs> um, so definitely. Um, so let's connect. Um, off this line. Um, and you know, let's continue this work. Black Solidarity Day is the day that. We talk about what we're going to do. And then we do it. After this coming election. So, so let's get. All right. Uh, I would just like to say travel. one thing, Ken, if you would allow hey, me. Hey, no, go right ahead. Okay. So, um, Dr. Kimball, you said something about students, right? I did. So I'm just holding you to that, please. Hey, I'm, I'm please. Oh, yeah. Uh, anybody else is willing uh, to join. I know we're very busy and I know we're doing a lot, but you know, in any way, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have to we have to talk. So so I know exactly how to present it to the students, you know what I mean? But like no yeah. Problem. No problem. Hey, when I was a student at Mega, we was going into the community. You know, many moons ago, but we we would go into the community and, and work inside of these schools. So um, we need to get back to doing that. Thank you. All right, everyone, stay well. All, All right. right, take care, please. Vanguard up. Vanguard up. Uhuru. <laughs> Uhuru. <laughs>
uh, I dropped 